This program is made possible by Zoho Corporation. Hello and welcome. I'm Kamla. On today's show, we are talking music and jazz. And my guests are Professor Aaron Linkton of San Jose State University and Chris Motta, who just graduated from San Jose State and you majored in guitar? Yeah, jazz guitar. Yeah. Jazz. There's a lot of new things in jazz today. I think maybe one of the most important things that is new is the inclusion of so much technology in the music uh, with the way that people spread music around using technology, uh, the way educators can use technology to teach students and the way students can use technology to learn uh, with the help of a, of a teacher or even a lot of times without, e without a mm -hmm. teacher. They can use technology to teach themselves a lot of things, which is a lot different from how it used to be. Mm. Um, there's still the, you know, this, the old thing of the, the, the master and the student or the master and the apprentice, I think is still very, uh, you know, still very active and still used all the time. But there's a lot that students can do now with technology that, that they were not able to do 10, 15, 20 years ago. So augment their learning skills. Absolutely. Okay. So Chris, you probably use a lot of technology. That's right, yeah. So one of the things that I think of instantly is, a lot, we, as jazz musicians, we do a lot of transcribing, or like literally copying solos. So nowadays I can plug... When you say literally copying solos, you take a, uh, sheet music and... Yeah, or even nowadays on the computer. I'll just learn it on the guitar and then enter it in on the computer. But nowadays I can take a, like an MP3 file, slow it down, and learn like very easily. Whereas in Aaron's day, you had to just listen to it full <laughs> speed. <laughs> yeah. So you had to listen to that record or CD over and over again. Right. The idea with these transcribed solos is mm. it's uh, if you're trying to... If you have a favorite musician that you like the way he or she plays the guitar or the saxophone, you would listen to recordings of theirs and figure out exactly all the notes that they played in, in, in an improvised solo. Uh, you're basically trying to internalize someone's style. It's sort of like a comedian learning to do impersonations or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, jazz musicians want, you know, I, you, might, you might love the way Charlie Christian plays a right. guitar or love the way that uh, John Schofield plays a guitar. And so you listen to their music and you try to really internalize and, and, and copy their style in, a, in an attempt to uh, color your own style. So is there a fine distinction because you probably the first time when you do that you are actually mimicking that's right the great mm -hmm. master mm -hmm. or the great uh, mistress or whatever. Mm -hmm. When do you start improvising and kind of developing your own style? How do you do that? Well, I, I think the timeline of it is different for, for every musician, but I do think that there are three very distinct uh, steps that every musician, every jazz musician goes through. And the, and the first step is imitation, where you literally are, are just imitating this person that you admire, this person you admire, et cetera, et cetera. The second step then is assimilation, where you start to combine elements of all these people you have imitated into a style that then starts to become something a little different, some sort of a conglomerate of, of those, all those styles that you studied. And in the last step that not everyone necessarily gets to would be innovation, where then you've, you've taken the styles you've imitated, you've assimilated in the, into something uh, a little bit more unique, and then innovation would be literally come up, coming up then with something absolutely brand new. Uh, which, which is very challenging. I, I, I would go so far to say that not every jazz musician gets to that third step. Um, even, even very famous jazz musicians might, might not necessarily have reached that stage of innovation. They might have a long career of this wonderfully, uh, th this very beautifully crafted assimilated style, and that that's, can be totally fine. Uh, it's the very few, the, the tenth of a hundredth of a percent of musicians that reaches that innovative stage and those are the people who propel the music give forward. us an example of examples I think uh, Louis Armstrong would have been an early example of an innovator um, on the trumpet and, and as an improviser Duke Ellington was an innovator uh, as a as a composer and an arranger um, Charlie Parker was an innovator on the saxophone created a new language called bebop that's a that's a style of jazz playing. 
Uh, John Coltrane was an in in innovator on the saxophone as well, really kind of created a new, really a new language, Cr created a whole genre of people that people mm -hmm. would say they're a Coltrane clone, people, mm. that, people that are really, they love John Coltrane so much, they're r literally just trying to sound exactly like him. Those are some examples. There are others as well. Ella Fitzgerald. Ella Fitzgerald, definitely an innovator from a vocal, vocal. F as, as a vocal standpoint. Okay. Absolutely. Chris, what was the first song that you tried to transcribe and mimic? Um, well, when learning the guitar, I was really into blues and rock, so I learned very, almost every uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan mm -hmm. solo I could get my hands on, who's a blues guitar player, and right. I would say that I was definitely imitating him. You could tell, like, older people would say, who are you working on? And, and they could instantly uh, hear, without even me saying Stevie Ray Vaughan, that I was listening who to else? a lot of Steve. Um, then I think my grandpa gave me a Wes Montgomery CD, mm -hmm. who's a famous jazz guitar player. And um, I think I was pretty much hooked on jazz ever since then. I was probably 15 or 16, so. And you, Aaron, who was the first person you tried to mimic? Um, well, I also played a lot of guitar. Uh, oh, for, you played? For, oh. For, <laughs> many, for many years, I played guitar uh, quite a bit for about 20 years. And, and so I also, I interestingly enough, mm -hmm. I, I would loved Stevie Ray Vaughan. I'm, I'm from Texas originally. Stevie Ray Vaughan is, is, a, te is a Texan. Thanks. And uh, I, used, I, I saw him live a number of times before he passed away. And uh, I used to try to copy his style quite a bit. But it, but it was the blues guitar that actually kind of got me into improvising on the saxophone because I started bringing my saxophone along to, in Texas, there's a lot of jam sessions where people just play blues. And uh, I would bring my guitar and play at these jam sessions, and I'd also bring my saxophone and, and, and play, play some blues on my saxophone also. So what is the attraction with Stevie uh, style of playing music or guitar that, interestingly, both of you <laughs> try to mimic first? It's very, lyri it's very lyrical also very technical. He, he had a really great balance between those two things, I think. It can be easy to play all technique, which can be flashy, but it can be kind of tiring to mm -hmm. listen to after a little while. Um, you can play all lyrically, which can be very beautiful, but then maybe it lacks some kind of excitement. And I think he had a really great balance between those two things. And he also had a really distinctive tone uh, mm -hmm. on the guitar that not a lot of guitarist I think we're able to achieve. I thought Jimi Hendrix would be the one that you both would <laughs> say. Well, Jimi Hendrix is pretty amazing as well. Yeah. And of course, Stevie Ray, Vaughan was, Stevie Ray Vaughan himself was a huge uh, fan. fan of Jimi Hendrix, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and who else? Who are the other musicians <coughs> that, that you would like to uh, learn from? Well, I because you talked about technology. Oh, for sure, for sure. Well, I, I had studied quite a bit. Uh, you can see my baritone saxophone here in the, in the <laughs> backdrop. Um, I play baritone saxophone 99% of the time when I play saxophone, and so I had a, I was a, was and still am a very very big fan of a baritone saxophonist named Pepper Adams. Mm. It was a saxophone. He played with Stan Kenton's band and Charlie Mingus and a number of other bands, and he had a solo career. Stanley Kenton is from Los Angeles, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Stan the West yeah. Coast cool mm -hmm. jazz. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so I, I studied a lot of Pepper Adams, and uh, I, I still love listening to his music, and I have transcribed, we were talking about transcriptions, mm -hmm. I've transcribed a lot of his music. What does transcribe mean to somebody who is not musically educated? Mm -hmm. Both of you talk about transcribing a track. What does that mean? So what you would do, uh, and this is how technology can help out a lot. What, what I did in, when I was in school, when I was learning how to play, I would hear a solo, that I liked, maybe the whole thing or maybe just a small part of it. And when I say solo, it's an improvised solo. So you're listening to a jazz piece, it gets to the part of the, of, of the, of the song where people are improvising. So I would say, man, boy, I, I really like this section of this part of the solo. It's, it's, for whatever reason, it would speak to me in some way. So then I would sit down with my saxophone and I would play that section of the piece over and over and over again. I would figure out exactly what what the guy was playing, okay? And then after I figured it out and memorized it, I usually would then notate it, write it down into notes and rhythms and whatnot. And what that helps do is that it helps me as an improvising musician, it helps me, you, you literally get the feeling of what it feels like to play a, a great jazz solo, and it helps you start building vocabulary. It's just like 
learning new vocabulary words. You, you know, it's, so it's like if you think back to when you're in third grade and you, you learn a new vocabulary word and how to <laughs> spell it, right? Right. What's the very next thing they ask you to do? They say, use it in a sentence. Sentence, right. So it's, it's one thing to, you sort of understand a little bit about what it is, but you have to know how to utilize it in some sort of context. So transcribing helps you learn melodies in, in some sort of a harmonic context where you can use them when you're improvising. So that's what we're going to do next. That's right. So the next section, you're going to play some songs. That's right. And then you're going to improvise and tell us what was the original tune like, mm -hmm. and then what was the improvisation you did. Right. So Aaron, you're going to be playing the original track of uh, A Train. Take the A Train, right. Take the A Train. And then you're going to tell us when you improvise, how do we recognize the improvisation that you bring into the Exactly, track? Okay. exactly. Tell us a little bit about Take the A Train. Sure, so this is a piece of music written by Billy Strayhorn, who was a, uh, a pianist and a composer who worked a lot with Duke Ellington. Who Duke Ellington, of course, very, very famous name in American popular music. And um, this is probably the most well-known piece of music that Billy Strayhorn wrote, and it was a huge hit for Duke Ellington's band. And uh, what I thought we would do is play just the first phrase of it, not very long, eight, eight measures only, um, the original melody, and then talk a little bit about what jazz mu musicians would do to a melody like that when they're improvising. Okay, so I let you play the eight measures. Okay. <laughs> okay. You ready? Yeah. One, two, oh. <laughs> What jazz musicians would do, if you, if you are a, uh, a listener going to a jazz concert, you'll hear a lot of songs like this. And they play a melody that you probably recognize, and then they go off the lar long portion of the detour. performance, a <laughs> detour, a long portion of the performance, you're like, well, I don't hear the melody anymore. And then you'll hear the melody again at the very end, sort of like bookends, but what's all this stuff going on in the middle? Well, the stuff going on in the middle is improvisation, and um, the, the chord sequence, the chord progression of the piece will always remain constant, but the melodies that the musicians will play over these chord changes will change every time the chord changes uh, cycle through. And it can be pretty complex, it can be pretty simple as well. And so what I wanted to do was demonstrate a little bit of a, of a simple kind of way that someone would would improvise okay, okay. so yeah. before we uh, uh, forget as a listener sometimes i may not be aware that what you the musician are doing is doing improvisation mm -hmm. so should i feel <coughs> bad or should i feel left out what should i be feeling or should i just go along with the flow and appreciate it i think <laughs> going along with the flow is, is is a good way to do it and also it, i really think i mean jazz definitely can be enjoyed uh listening to a CD or an MP3 or, or whatever, uh, but I think it can be even more readily enjoyed when you're wa watching and listening to it live because you can go along for the ride, but then you're also able to see the interactions between the different musicians. There's a lot of interactions going on. Of course, with Chris and I, mm -hmm. it's just two of us. Uh, most jazz groups going to be three to five people, and so you can see interactions between the saxophonist and the bass player and the drummer and their different it's it's really a conversation it's a dialogue it's a musical dialogue rather than a, a verbal dialogue okay so now you're going to do the uh, improv part exactly so so something that a jazz musician would 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 do is play certain types of patterns so you might hear something very simple a, a lot of uh, of you watching this show have probably know what a scale is or have heard of a scale <laughs> So jazz musicians can use scales like that when they're playing, uh, when they're improvising. They can use small parts of a scale. That's just the first, first half of a scale. So while we're playing that same um, uh, melody, uh, Chris and I will play the melody as is, what we just did, and then we'll right away go into it again, and I'll use just that tiny part of a scale to, to improvise on. Okay, so here we go. Two. A 
Another thing people might do is use e even, even fewer notes than that, maybe just a couple of notes. Let's do the same thing just with a couple of notes. One, a two, a one, uh, uh. <laughs> and I'm changing it a little by little as the chords change. So that would be a, an example of a very simple improvisation. Uh, you might not hear if you go to here in the Bay Area like um, Yoshi's or some of these other, you know, and you hear some like world-class touring jazz musicians, you're not really gonna hear solos like that. Mm. Uh, but that is an, an excellent starting point for any um, beginning improviser. And it's also, I think, it's a, it's a good way to illustrate what it is that's going on. You you're taking small little ideas, and then you're, you're slightly changing them as, as the chords uh, move along. So now you're going to play your version of Take the A Train. So we'll play the melody, and then I will play through the chords one time. Chris will play through the chords one time, and we'll play the melody again and end. OK, so if okay. you can come a little bit, yes. Sure. <coughs> With the intro. OK, here we go. <coughs> to believe that it's over 80 or 90 years old, uh, this tune? That is an old song. Yes, old song, yeah. but it's still so fresh. Yeah. yeah? Can be. What is the next one that you're going to play? Uh, I think we play Body and Soul. OK. Ted, so you'll play a little bit and talk <coughs> also about the improvisation part. Um, I can do whatever you'd like me to do on this one. We would love to. <laughs> so if you could play a little 
measure and then talk about sure. the improvisation and sure. then play the whole tune. That'll be fantastic. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so um, what, what Chris and I are going to do on this one, uh, this is Body and Soul, which is a very well-known um, uh, ballad. And I, I actually believe this is the, the most recorded uh, song, I think, in the, in, the, in the jazz repertoire. And it's from the Great American Songbook um, repertoire and uh, recorded by many, many different people, but it's a ballad, so it's slow. And so rather than uh, me play the melody and then improvising and then the melody again, we're going to do uh, just the melody one time through. And so Chris and I are gonna do something s slightly different on this one where uh, rather than me just playing the melody and him just comping, uh, which is short for accompanying, which is what he's been doing on the guitar, um, we're gonna kind of play off of each other a little bit more. It's gonna be a little bit more interactive. So as an example of, uh, of a, a very straightforward interpretation versus what Chris and I are gonna do, mm -hmm. uh, let's play, again, just the first phrase mm -hmm. uh, very traditionally. I'll just okay. play the melody very straight ahead mm -hmm. and then you can comp okay. and then we'll play through the whole thing. Sounds good. Okay. <laughs> All right. the melody in a, a very straightforward uh, rendition. Uh, so now Chris and I are going to play through the whole melody okay. um, and we're going to see what happens. This is the <laughs> improvisation part. Um, when we were planning the pieces to play I just sent Chris a list of tunes and we, I said let's play these songs. Uh, no rehearsal, right. right? But these are these are songs that we that we both know. <laughs> going to be our last song, Bag's Groove, right. which is a blues tune. Right. So the, a blues tune, it, it refers to really a chord progression that was uh, sort of codified by a particular style of music called the blues. So you can hear someone being called a blues musician, people that play the blues. It's, it's, a, it's a specific form of music. It's a 12-bar form, and there's a specific set of chord changes. Uh, we were talking earlier about Stevie Ray Vaughan being a great blues guitarist, and I would say probably Chris, probably 85% of the music he recorded were 
was a blues, blues was in it, was form a, and style. A, yeah. Blues yeah. in form and in style. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, but there are jazz musicians that play blues. There's western swing musicians that play blues. There's uh, blues form and all all kinds of different music. And so Bag's Groove is a blues, and we thought we would play that for you in kind of a funky style. Oh, funky! This is your own. Uh, our our own <laughs> rendition of Bag's Groove. Okay, and who uh, composed it? This is a uh, uh, Milt uh, Jackson. Right. Milt Jackson uh, composed this tune, and this is a well-known blues melody in, in amongst jazz musicians. Okay, and what yeah. is it that we should be looking out when Chris is playing? So he's going to play, since we're going to do this in more of a funky style, right. uh, his comping is going to be, you want to give a little demonstration yeah. of... Rhythmic is more active rhythmically. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> all right. we are, we're all we're all yes. All right. All right. <coughs> you want to just damp on this? Aaron. You're very welcome. And thank you, Chris. What a funkified and bluesy <laughs> kind of a tune. I really loved it. And that was Bag's Groove. Ba bag's groove. So we are closing <coughs> out on Bag's Groove. Thank you all for watching. We'll be back again next week with another edition of our show. Until then, goodbye. This program is made possible by Zoho Corporation.